happy Monday, everyone. It's the first day of the week. You know what that means. We have your weekend box office report coming your way. And on top of that, there is a report out there saying that we're getting a brand new Honey, I Shrunk the Kids movie starring Josh Gad. Apparently, it's something called, I'm not going to pronounce this right, a Lego sequel? See what they did there? No, I don't care. I don't like that. All right. But you know what I do like right now? I like the two people I'm sitting next to. It is John Roca and Gray Drake. Woo! Wow, wow, wow. A busy, fun. busy lady right here with so many wonderful things happening. Do you want to tell our viewers really quickly what your new title is? Yes, I am Ms. Movie Phone. And this whole summer, uh, every Friday, we will have an episode of the Ms. Movie Phone show up for your viewing enjoyment. Please share it. Please like it. Otherwise, I'll be fired and it'll be your fault. Oh. <laughs> Don't let that happen, guys. She is wonderful, and I can't wait to watch that show somebody, all summer long. Somebody all put right. fire behind that cackle. I liked it. Go ahead. Always. Yes. There's always fire behind that cackle. Oh, wow. <laughs> We've got our box office report coming your way right now, and the actual numbers did come in, so you might see some different numbers on the graphic right now. Avengers Endgame wound up taking in another $63.3 million this weekend. That brings its domestic total to $723.5 million, making it the fourth movie ever at the domestic box office to cross 700 million with force awakens avatar black panther on top of that the global cum for this movie now sits at 2.485 billion dollars so i don't know maybe avatar is in reach right now detective pikachu that movie wound up opening up pretty strong also the actuals for that one were 54.4 million dollars that right there makes it the largest opening for a video game adaptation ever. And the movie it wound up topping was Lara Croft Tomb Raider with $47.7 million. Let's backpedal a little here first. So I brought up Avatar earlier, just very briefly, because we've discussed this quite a bit. Does the number that Avengers Endgame worldwide sit at right now, does it change your thoughts at all with whether or not this movie could catch Avatar and become the highest grossing movie ever? It's definitely going to. <laughs> I think there's no question because it's just a juggernaut. It's going to keep going and keep going. And there's nothing that's going to open aside from Lion King that's going to give it any, well, okay, Toy Story. But I'm just saying it's all in the same family. It's that's still a good it. ways away too. I that's mean, that's right. the end of June. That's yep. the end of, end of June. And then on top of that, even though Avatar is the one that had the better shot of having longer legs because of the time of year it came out, I also think Spider-Man Far From Home is going to work in Endgame's favor because when that movie comes out, there might be a resurgence in people seeing Endgame again. Mm. So we could see a lot more money in the future, even well down the line. Uh, it reaffirms me, to me that they're not going to cross it. I, I think it's I think it's going to come in second. You had to be it, a contrarian. I did. It, all, it already dropped lower than expected this week uh, with its box office total. And if you look at the way it's tracking it's not tracking to necessarily beat avatar it has a chance to but it's no longer a definite considering how it's been tracking over the last couple of weeks so to me i don't think it's got enough legs to do it i think the pikachu thing is a surprising almost 60 million dollars that lets you know we got john wick i think nobody people are predicting 20 30 million who knows it could be 60 it could be 70 you don't know what the taste is for these kinds of films if there's enough people to go out and see it and then you have aladdin coming you mentioned lion king you mentioned spider-man maybe you're right Perry, maybe the Spider-Man Far From Home will give it a bump and push it over the line, but I, I didn't feel it was definite after second week's numbers. I was like, oh, I don't think so, and reading some of the breakdown from Scott Mendelson at Forbes, I kind of feel like, well, maybe it doesn't have the legs that people thought, but so I, I'm still in that camp that I don't think it's going to do it. James Cameron's going to be writing another one of them little pictures. Yeah, yeah. I'm waiting for like, it. I'm oh, waiting yeah. to see how creative he gets with oh, that. Oh, boy, it looks like <laughs> Iron Man killed the Navi. Mm. <laughs> Hi, Executor in the live chat is also saying that Aladdin is going to cause some trouble mm. too and yeah but I think when we talk about things basically becoming roadblocks for Avengers Endgame it's more of the hundred million dollars and north opening weekend right. and I actually don't think uh, Aladdin is going to wind up cracking that number but moving over to Detective Pikachu now because this is a pretty big deal we're mm. constantly you know babbling on about the video game curse and all that nonsense <laughs> apparently from a critical perspective and now at the box office it has been broken a little bit so what would you guys say to somebody else out there working on a video game adaptation, what should they take from Detective Pikachu in order to ensure similar success? Ooh, ooh. Yes, please. <laughs> yes, please. Ryan Reynolds. Yeah. Pretty Thank much. You. <laughs> yeah. Pretty he was, much. He was really the big linchpin mm -hmm. of this, I think. I, I feel like that's the reason that Pikachu got out to people. And combined with a script that really kind of 
put his sensibilities on display. Mm. It was just weird enough to work. Mm -hmm. And he's also like a mini marketing uh, department all on his own. A hundred percent. It's like, yes, I drink his gin now. I never drank gin before. Oh, wow. You drink my I didn't know he had his own gin. He did. Aviation, look it up. I'm yeah, I think he probably used, going to. I think he used Jackman to promote it too, yeah, and a couple course. other people. So no, I, I absolutely agree with Drake. It's 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 a combo of a good script and Ryan Reynolds, and kind of like manipulating the script around Ryan Reynolds to make it work and accentuate him. It's really funny. Before Deadpool, Ryan Reynolds was heading towards like straight to DVD stuff, and now look at him. It's incredible. When you give him a chance to shine in the right material, he blew up. I've been a big fan of his since Van Wilder. I even love Just Friends. People need to give that thing a shot. And you see what he's able to do with the right kind of comedy. And Perry, you make a great point. He is his own mini marketing machine, and he does inventive things with it. He's very funny with it. Fans feel like he's a, he's a guy they can relate to, they can hang out with, and they want to go and support his work and he just has that kind of energy and that helps overall mm -hmm. to push something like this but that a minus cinema score is also fantastic means audiences giving it a chance and loving it when they walk out of the theater for the most part well, that's, the, that's the other thing about it is that this movie seems to tap into one of the main draws of pokemon overall and mm. it's this it's almost this like fantasy quality of like you play the game or let's say you watch the movie and you walk out saying i want a pokemon I want mm -hmm. a little buddy next to me. <laughs> They're so cute. It does have that kind of effect, and I think that kind of effect will wind up spreading the love and maybe keeping it afloat this weekend. There, there's also a rare component of Pikachu that most video games don't have, and that's sort of the detective angle, mm. where they turned the movie into a film noir, which made it really unusual. Because most of the time, it's like you think about Silent Hill or even Rampage, and it's mm. just kind of like guns and running around. An explosion. But this... Somehow this video game really lent itself to a story. And so they were able to keep so many elements of the video game in the actual movie. And it, it, somehow it worked. It's one of the most perplexing things I've ever seen. Well, the only concern, too, uh, and not to be a contrary, and again, is it didn't, <laughs> it didn't perform well in China as they anticipated. And it, that, that's what affected uh, Shazam getting over $400 million, keeping mm. it under because it didn't perform well in China. So you look at the way they, they had prognosticated it to uh, perform in China. It didn't do as well as they thought. So that may affect overall if it crosses back. That uh, uh, Warcraft number, if it beats that Warcraft number at 433 million globally, if it'll come close to it, I think if you're not performing in China, it can affect you overall mm. as a studio it, or, and as a thing. It is so. an interesting thing to consider, a good thing to have brought up. Right yeah. now, according to Box Office Mojo, this movie has a production budget of 150 million. That's a and lot. worldwide at this point in time, it's at a little over. Uh, 166 million. Mm -hmm. So it has cleared its production budget, but sure. you know, you got to count for marketing and all that stuff. And again, long legs of the box office are very, very important. Mm -hmm. So we'll see what happens with this one. Before we move on from box office, I wanted to pose one other question to you guys because Box Office Pro, it's a great site, a great utility tool that often does uh, dish out long range projections. And they posted their projection for Spider Man Far From Home. And what they're saying right now is a range of 90 to 120 million for the three-day weekend. So it wouldn't necessarily hmm. be the biggest opening for an MCU movie ever, but still a very substantial amount of money. Is that kind of the range you guys thought this one would fall in? Do you recall what the opening weekend was for The Homecoming? first one, 122, I think. Wow. And change. Yeah, I think that... Spidey more than a lot of characters in the MCU is really benefiting from Endgame. Mm -hmm. um, also Infinity War, because yeah. that was a moment that really captured people's hearts from the from Infinity. And so I think that like that it seems a, like 90 to 120 seems like wildly optimistic, but I, I mean I could see it 90 over a Fourth of July weekend wow. where nothing else is coming out. I got I got 150 in my head. I, I, wow, I, really? I, I think so. I think, <laughs> oh my god! I think so. You know, look, I'm crazy. When sometimes. did you get so positive? <laughs> No, I mean, look, I was crazy when predicting that, uh, you know, Black Panther would go over 200 million and it did it. And I just feel like Spider-Man, because of that's a great point you make, great Infinity War and Endgame both gave some more love to Tom Holland. People love Homecoming and people love Tom Holland. And also you look at this, the trailer is him replacing Iron Man. So people want to see what mm. this is all about. Is he going to replace Iron Man? How are they going to make it work? Is Mysterio right? We're talking about a multiverse. So the comic book nerds are running to go see this. And if it's good, 
I think they will go over and over and over again. Marvel's crossed that line with this almost, we're saying, like we're saying will it cross Avatar? That is going to lift all the ships in its stable. And I think, and I think uh, Far From Home will see a massive benefit from that. So if I'm thinking about your number right yeah. now, Roka, and it comes in like the 150 million zone, that would equal where Captain Marvel opened up. And if we're talking about 90 to, let's say, you know, mm. 120 or something like that, it would be right around, oh, it was my bad. Spider-Man Homecoming opened with 117. I was a little off there. And it was mm. Thor Ragnarok Still. that took 122. Mm. So nice. it does seem like a very realistic mm. point for it to hit to me. And mm. I would be surprised if it didn't top the first Spider-Man movie because the first Spider-Man right. movie had the added benefit of us saying like, oh my God, Spider-Man is finally in the MCU. But after the events of Endgame, that makes this, this is the first movie mm -hmm. after Endgame. That makes it a top priority to oh, see. Yeah. It's going to be the thing that kind of shapes what we're looking at in terms of what's to come in the MCU. I think it's going to be a top priority. Is it like our only kind of superhero, super, superhero y movie? I'm looking you deep From in your Marvel? eyes. I know, I yeah, like is, that. Is, is that summer? Yeah, is that for, the, well, kinda, for the rest of the summer? It's the last Marvel film, isn't it? It is kind of. Right? For the if, year. For the yes. year, right? Yeah, for the year then, it is. And then basically after that, we have Star Wars, like in that right. sort of that area of fandom. So Joker kind of counts. Oh, too, Joker? Though. That's true. That's even, true. Well, even though it's a villain. I don't know that it's going to have, have huge right. superhero numbers, though, because it seems a little moody. That's just a, more of a 70, 50 to 70, I would say, for yeah. Joker. But uh, the, the thing that Feige did, which was brilliant was to say that spider-man far from home is the last movie in this phase mm -hmm. so i think that's going to get people to the theater as well saying like well what is it going to introduce is there a post-credit scene that introduces fantastic four or x-men or warlock or whatever we're yeah. going or the asgardians of the galaxy we don't know so the excitement there builds of what they're how they're going to end this phase and introduce or lay the seeds for the next phase in this movie do you know i, what you, I just got excited now talking about it we actually. forgot a superhero movie 150 what wow X Men Dark Phoenix. Oh Jesus! Oh right, <laughs> June seventh. Yeah, that's uh, so, that's right around the corner. We'll see what happens with that one. I'm soon curious enough. to see how fans show up for that one because yeah. I think Apocalypse kind of destroyed a little enthusiasm. A lot in, in Gray Drake's life for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag lame duck. I, I think a lot of us are feeling that a uh, little bit here. Yeah. All right. Before we move on, I am going to first remind you that our second story of the day is the Josh Gad Honey I Shrunk the Kids story. But we got to tell you right now. There's some cool stuff coming to this channel today, live, very soon. Check out this promo. Hey guys, Riley here, and let me tell you about Rule of Two. You looking for a Star Wars fix? Well, Rule of Two is that show. It drops down Collider Video's main YouTube channel, as well as on Podcast One's Jedi Council feed. So go over there, subscribe, share it with your friends. It's hosted by myself and Mark Fernandez. We talk everything in the Star Wars universe with a lot of deep dives and a lot of conversations that go all in. You know what to do. Subscribe, join us there, and rise. <laughs> Be sure to check out <laughs> Rule of Two live today, 5 p.m. Pacific. And then on top of that, we had someone chime in in the live chat. Shane O earlier today wrote in RDJ for the Oscar. You know what? That's on our minds, too. So we're giving you a very special Avengers Endgame themed FYC episode. I will be there. Jeff Snyder, Scott Mance. Wednesday, this Wednesday at 1 p.m. PT Live, we're going to talk about all of the possibilities for Endgame as far as the Oscars go. So tune in to see what we think on that. Now it is time for that story you've all been waiting for. It's Honey, I Shrunk the Kid. So <laughs> this comes from an exclusive over at Slash Film, and they're reporting that Walt Disney Pictures is developing a reboot of the movie with Josh Gad now attached to Star. And according to their report, the plan is for the movie to be set a about three decades after the 1989 original, with Gad set to play the grown-up version of scientist and inventor Wayne Zelensky's son, Nick. They also go on to say that the movie is going to be titled Shrunk and that it's being positioned as a legacy sequel because <laughs> it apparently exists in the same world as the original movie and also continues that over I, yeah i know that was my reaction too that overall storyline with nick so that's josh gad's character accidentally shrinking his kids because he learned nothing from dear old dad <laughs> so how do you guys feel about this one for first off where would you be more likely to watch this movie? Would you pay to see it in, in a my theater? underwear at home? Is that Ew. what you're going for? Yeah, that is what I'm going for. But you said it first. Sorry, probably that. Now we got the answer. Yeah, <laughs> probably that. Um, I th but I, I want to say fantastic casting. 
Josh Gad is awesome mm-hmm. casting. Like, yep. is any if anybody is going to be Rick Moranis's son, it's going to be Josh Gad. That does feel like spot on casting, and Love you know, it. Disney has such a good relationship with him. And I, I know some out there might say his style of comedy is a little bit too much. And if that's the case, he he plays such a him role in the movie Little Monsters with Lupita Nyong'o. That's mm. immediately where my mind goes to right now. But I feel like he could balance that with like more of a charming quality in something like this. I hope that it leads to him or Disney pulling Mr. Rick Moranis out of retirement <gasps> to do a couple of scenes because oh. there is no actor who's retired from acting that I miss more this side of Gene Hackman than mm. Rick Moranis, who I love two pieces and has been an essential part of my childhood and growing up years. And the fact that he no longer brings his brand of comedy to the screen is heartbreaking. And so to have him come back and do just a couple of scenes with Josh would be fantastic. Maybe some counsel about what's happening. But you know, you look at this, you're always gonna repeat the same mistakes as his dad. Is, is that exciting? Is that interesting? Maybe not, but Josh Gad is the reason you go to see this or watch this. I would totally see this in theater because Josh is great. I buy this more than the Penguin talk. That's for sure in my opinion, but I like him being involved in this and it's the right energy. You were right. It's the right energy of Rick Moranis in the next generation to bring to this project. Now I know every time you text me, I text you and you don't respond. It's because you're sobbing just watching Strange Brew over and oh. over <laughs> and over. And Little again. Shop of Horrors and Parenthood. Oh, all, all of those. Them. Um, yeah. But here's what's great about this is the that CG is so good now. Yes. So they did a lot with those effects back mm. then. And I think the movies actually still kind of hold up. I've seen only I, pieces of them. I think it does. I mean, yeah. I, don't, I don't know if it's, you know, a whole lot of nostalgia still in me mm-hmm. because I did grow up watching and rewatching that movie over and over yeah. again. But when you think about something like Ant-Man and Ant-Man and the Wasp, if yeah. they could use that kind of tech to bring this to screen in a new, fresh way, I would be totally open to it. With Rick Moranis coming back... Mm. Wouldn't you think that's what they were going for if they're going out of their way to coin a new like sequel yeah. reboot term? Keep it in the universe. Why, why <laughs> keep it in so the universe mm-hmm. and make him the son if you're not going to have some sort of cameo there? Like a sequel. Like a sequel, <laughs> yeah. Like, just like a stay, toe stay away, stay out of swinging distance, Roka, because I'm going <laughs> to go crazy. What are they going to turducken? It's like a turducken. <laughs> Stop it. Stop it with those terms. Well, um, the reason I bring up the uh, yeah. streaming versus theatrical thing is because a while ago, this movie came up in a report when we were covering a whole bunch of remakes being in the works for Disney Plus but this Slash film article is saying that they are eyeing a theatrical release for this one Mm. which I guess personally I, I do think they're better off doing that why are they looking for a director Joe Johnston is still working, ladies and gentlemen. Oh. Bring him back to do his version of him. Did you miss Captain America, the first Avenger? That's a fantastic MCU film. Bring Joe Johnston back to do it again with Josh Gad's different energy, different collaboration, so you you can still have a new, fresh movie. I would love to have him back to this thing. Does anyone come to mind if not Joe Johnston? Because mm. the way they put it in their report is that they're specifically looking for a filmmaker who has nostalgia for the original property. So if not Joe Johnston, mm-hmm. then who? It's a good Boy. question. Well, this is one of those opportunities that like Jurassic Park seized on and there are mm. several other properties where you find these folks who have such a deep love for the property. But the trick is, for people that do our job, it's a little tricky because I don't know anybody that's spoken about Honey, I Shrunk the Kids no. in a nostalgic way. <laughs> but I know there are plenty. Yes, there are plenty of fans. So, there, so there's a really talented, popular filmmaker out there that's like, dude, Rick Moranis and Honey, I Shrunk the Kids totally informed my directing career. Mm. I just don't know who it is. <laughs> Yet. Maybe Guillermo. Oh, I mean, obviously, I'd watch amazing. anything that Guillermo directs. And, and, Too scary. <laughs> and you gotta have. I got. It's in the uni, It's in, under the Disney umbrella. So we gotta have a Paul Rudd cameo, don't you? Some kind of Ant Man cameo. I mean, it just seems so logical. Okay. Ant- settle down, Roka. Auntie the Ant. I used to yeah. love that character. They, they, I wanted one it. like a Pokemon. I wanted an ant. Yeah. See, there you <laughs> it's go. Just a thing that happened. Those are simpler times. Sean Tillman <laughs> in the live chat is saying a yes to this movie being on Disney Plus and mm. no to a theater release so I'm curious to see if that winds up becoming an issue when all is said and done with this one oh, we shall see Brad Bird Brad Bird would be that's fun that's a great choice right he'd be fun to come back it, and do some live action Joe Cornish stuff. oh Joe Cornish yeah. Yeah. that's a great choice as well it would crush on Disney Plus yeah. I would yeah. I'd tune in immediately mm-hmm. I, de- I definitely would tune in immediately but I also think I would probably spend money to see this in the theater yes and I feel you I, direct it Perry I, okay done. boom when are you hiring me? I'm in. I, I do feel like everybody with nostalgia for this franchise, it's something that I will immediately encourage my little cousins to go see when uh-huh. it comes out. So it is something that could be four quadrant and get everyone involved and who knows, 
make a lot of money. This isn't that the point, almost always. <laughs> See, I finally agree with you. There you go. <laughs> All right, before we tune out now, we are gonna hit some of these questions <laughs> in the live chat. So. You guys are not joining us for FYC, so I want to pose this question to you right now. Me Vita Mocha is asking, anyone better than RDJ in 2019? Will he win the Oscar for Best Actor? That's an uphill battle right there. Not because I don't think he's worthy. He's super deserving of it, and it's one. Of, it's also the argument could be made for his body of work. Mm -hmm. Same thing. It's the Glenn Close argument. Mm -hmm. It's like, let's give her one already. Um, <laughs> but it is a superhero movie. They are not traditionally rewarded. Mm -hmm. We saw like we saw big strides last year with costumes, you know, for mm -hmm. Black Panther and Ruth Will um, Ruth Carter design too. and production design, but. I still think those are safe categories to award a superhero movie. So that's going to be tough for him to do that. Yeah, I agree with you because it feels more like an ensemble film because everyone has their journey in this film. You know, the Hulk has his journey. Captain America. I mean, you could argue Chris Evans is just as much emotional weight as Robert Downey Jr. They both care. And I would throw in Karen Gillum on, on the mm -hmm. supporting actress side. Absolutely. So... I agree with uh, Gray. It is an uphill climb and a half, and I don't know if anything has come out at this point in May that could necessarily is like the front runner as best actor. We're gonna get into the summer and maybe see some, but certainly in the fall is when we'll start seeing that. Yeah, kind of it's like, yeah. awfully early to answer that question because yeah. as a, if we gave them out today, then let's give it to him, right? Because he he was amazing. My lips are sealed until Wednesday. Tune in then. We have one more question today. This one is from Richard Begg in the live chat, and he's asking. Would the idea of another country taking on the purge law be appealing to you? I'd kind of like to see another society tackle it and see how that <gasps> unfolds. What about Sweden? Oh. <laughs> and then they just use all their <laughs> IKEA furniture to I kill everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised how specific you got. Who killed me? <laughs> the mom killed me. <laughs> um, I would, and I'm so frustrated that we don't see this more. Quiet Place happened all over the world. Give me 10 quiet places in 10 different countries. Mm. It would work. It's different societies, different countries. You get to enjoy it. Hire directors from those countries to create that. As we become more global with our movies, we need to become more global with our franchises. Certainly that could work in another country. Absolutely. In, or a Russian purge would be insane. A Japanese purge would be fantastic. An Australian purge would be out of this world. There's so much that could happen that you could explore about society and how they handle violence and crime in their worlds and frustration with it that you could have a ball with as a, as a filmmaker. Admittedly, the purge franchise is losing me a little bit mm. as a fan right now. So they are going to have to come up with a real rich idea to get me excited for purge five. But I think in either, I think it was the purge three and not purge two that they did bring up the idea of folks not from the United States specifically coming to the U.S. to purge because Ooh. they didn't have it in their country. So I do wonder oh. if maybe a story from mm -hmm. that perspective might be told or still to this day, I feel like I've been saying this from the very beginning, a purge that takes place in a super small town. I mean, the first purge was Staten Island. Most of the purge movies we've seen have been in more populated suburban areas or even a city. But I feel like in the middle of nowhere where there's yeah. a population of like that much, mm. maybe set something there and see how it feels different. Tell us what the purge would be like in Des Moines. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone watching in Des Moines. So Des Moines or Sweden, that is your vote, Craig. <laughs> this is going to be a very interesting franchise ahead of us. That's All it. right, that is it. That's a wrap on this episode of Movie Talk. <laughs> Guys, thank you so much to everyone in the live chat for chiming in. We love hearing your thoughts on all of these stories. Gray, thank you for being here. You. Roka, you rock. Adam in the booth, you know how much Woo! we appreciate you. A plus thumbnail. Guys, do not forget to like and share this episode of Movie Talk. Watch listen in the podcast network as well tell everybody you know about that it would be super helpful if you rated and commented over there and guess what we're going to be back tomorrow 3 p.m pt live for a brand new episode